Hey, thank you all for being here. And we're gonna have a great conversation this evening and it will be moderated by Michelle Treese and Brittany Butler. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw it over to them. Um, we do ask that you stay muted, um, but if you have questions, we definitely wanna hear from you. So please do um, ask questions or make comments in the chat and we'll try to address those as we go along. And thanks for being here. Hello, hello. How's everyone doing out there? It feels like it's been a while since I agree. To you, but I we agree. Have, yeah, we have some great guests tonight. We're going to have them introduce themselves. I'm completely not computer savvy <laughs> with this one. Okay. So let's start with uh, Carol. How about you introduce yourself? You've been here before. So who were you and tell us details? Well, thank you for having me again. I'm Daryl uh, Carter. I am an associate dean uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, a tenure full professor of history and a director of the Black American Studies program at East Tennessee State University. Great. And how about you, Ken? I'm Ken Majeski. Uh, I'm retired from ETSU. I was the uh, chair of the Department of Political Science and International Affairs for too many years. Um, and uh, that's about it. Right. So I just have to throw this in because the uh, conflict, not conflict of interest, what do you look? Full disclosure. Full disclosure. <laughs> Ken is my neighbor. And uh, one day I was, I don't know, doing something in my yard and Ken, <laughs> who I call him the, the mayor, drove by. And so we had this great conversation just about life and and somewhere in that conversation, Ken said that he, I think, maybe taught Daryl at a tissue or some kind of connection there. That is correct. And so I'm like, oh, we need to have these two on the show. So, so here we are. Well, that is that is correct. Uh, Ken was one of my faculty. I was a political science major. My my bachelor's degree is in political science, and uh, and then years later, uh, we became colleagues uh, in the last few years before he retired. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. I think it's cool to have teacher, student, and then colleague, colleague. I oh, think yeah. that's always a, yeah, a uh, sign of something. Daryl went way beyond uh, uh, anything I could have done. He's, he's, re he's really, he's really made a huge impact on, on his department and the university. That's great. I, I agree. Thank you. I agree. So I have an interesting question maybe we could start with. Just for those folks who aren't that familiar, how would you define political science? Like, are you studying just American politics, just certain facets of politics? How would I define political? Well, political science is a study of politics, right? And uh, politics can be defined in different kinds of ways. One, uh, one, one way to define it is who gets what, when, and how. And that's ultimately what politics is about. My own area was Latin American politics. Okay. And um, my research was based in that area as well. So if I said, if I took a look at your syllabus for a, a, an intro class, what would I see on that syllabus? Well, if you depend on what you looked at, if you looked at, I say, political life, for example, you would find a bunch of a polyglot of different kinds of readings okay. in there. There was no text per se. It was just about, um, it, it dealt with, it was basically a course that assumed that students were by and large pre-political. That is, they brought with them uh, baggage that was sort of hanging on from wherever it was, but they hadn't taken any serious discussion about things. They had their opinions, they had their, um, you know, they were mostly, from the region or they were conservative, you know, uh, students. And one of the things that um, I tried to get them to do in there beyond my syllabus is to, is to say that when you, when you come to a conclusion and you wanna say, this is my opinion, this is my attitude, then any of us owe this to everybody else. We owe this to you to show you how we got there. And I would start this silly discussion. I would say, okay, they, I'm going to make a claim here. I said, I'm, I believe the moon is made out of green cheese. And of course they would giggle. And I would say, well, what would be a reasonable response from you? 
And uh, so I finally got them to say, well, how did you, how did you arrive at that conclusion? So I told them I looked at them and I used my binoculars and I looked at the moon and it looked like green and cheesy. So they said, okay. And I said, well, do you have an alternative position? Of course, they all said, well, it's rocks and dust and stuff like that. So then I would say, well, gosh, you know what? You know, I've never been to the moon and I guess you were there. So you, you know about that dust. And of course they would say, no, I don't know about that. I've never, well, well, how did you get to know it was dust? Well, there were these people called astronauts and they came back with this dust. And I said, well, did they work? Who did they work for? I was, uh, NASA, North, North American Space Agency. And I said, oh, okay, that's part, is that part of the government? Oh yeah, that's part of the government. Well, could we say that when you hear something from the government, then that would be sufficient for you to agree with that and, and to form that opinion? Because the government has told you that the moon's been out of dust and rocks. No, so we would, that was kind of silly, but it was, it was an effort to, to say that opinions don't just hang up there. Of course, in today's world, they do. Well, and there's your science part because I use a very similar thing in my chemistry class. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, for the scientific method, it's pretty much the same thing. If you the hypothesis, the moon is made yeah. of cheese. Yeah. So it's like going through how yeah. you can actually determine and say yeah. and make a fact. Yeah. Well, the honest thing was that that you just have to show people this is my opinion, and this is the best I can offer you in terms of how I got there, um, as opposed to. Well, I just believe it's the case. You know, they, I, I, I wouldn't let them get away with it in, in class. They couldn't do that. Yeah. They'd have to come up with some sort of, and that based on the readings we did, kind of things like that. I used to do a thing in my biology class that said that fire is a living thing, and we would compare the characteristics of life, like seven, and they fit. And kids would be like, no, no, no. But by the time they really looked at that, they're like, like it might be, but really? I mean, but today, could you imagine that same conversation in the class? No, it would be, it'd be very tough. It would be very tough today. Um, when you have, um, of course, that was <clears throat> actually by the time I retired, which has been about 12 years ago or something, I sort of believe. Social media had already come come into, but now it's gone. It's it's uh, social media is on steroids now, and I think that's a that's a that's a part of what you know, we're we're facing. I think in uh, in this world, when people don't need to have, they don't they don't feel. We well, have people that are saying that uh, if you if you have a discussion about the 2020 election, um, and you say that. There is no credible counting you know, that would lead you to that conclusion. Now you have people saying, yeah, I, I agree with you, but in my heart. Mm -hmm. And so where do you go from there? I, I, I don't know. Carol, what do you teach right now? You, I know you're uh, I'm, a, I'm an American political historian. And I also teach uh, African American history. So, do you see these kind of kids in your class yeah. in 2022? And what did they say? What well, you know, our our students at ETSU tend to trend a little bit more conservative, as Ken said, and and that reflects the region, that reflects their parents. The the 18 and 19 year olds are not really formed yet, in my opinion. They're more reflecting their parents' mm -hmm. values on these issues. Um, your start. You know, so I, I throw that out there first. Second, we, I have seen in my own adulthood from when I went to ETSU as the first time 18-year-old freshman in 1997 till today, a huge sea change. Mm -hmm. um, it would have never occurred to me to challenge a faculty member in 1997 when I was in Sam McKinstry's Intro to American Gov class uh, in the fall of 97. It, it just, it would never have occurred to me to, to frontally challenge a faculty member, uh, particularly on factual issues. Uh, but I have students who do that today, hmm. you know, without any qualms about it. And they're like, well, how do you know that? Well, that's not true. My daddy told me so. I saw it on TikTok, mm -hmm. Twitch, Twitter, you know, um, you know, 
And students who, some of, some of whom the more bolder ones will flat out say, I have the right to feel the way I want to, no matter what your facts say. That's a really scary thing. Just, it's, it's, it's frightening because you can justify a lot of bad things when you do that. Yeah. And it tells me that we, we no longer as a society have big, large, agreed upon concepts that everybody has bought into. Whether it's American citizenship and what that means, what the government means, what the nature of facts are, um, you know, the value of education. I mean, the recent polling in recent years has shown that, you know, anywhere from 50 to 90 percent of Republicans uh, strongly distrust higher education. Strongly. That, that has not been there before. There's always been some concern about so-called liberal pointy-headed professors. Not like this. This is, we don't value it at all. And we're going to tell our kids not even to partake in it, right? Um, we can see that on the religious crowd, uh, for example, who will say, you know, uh, I don't care what you say, professor, in your chemistry course. Evolution doesn't exist. And it's my right to say that. And that's a really concerning thing in a field like ours is dedicated to what's provable, right? Uh, what is logical, what is reasonable, what uh, is, is vetted. Um, how, do you, how do you compete with that? And it's some kind of a interesting blurry line of where that would be. Like I can imagine in a chemistry class, if you say this is the characteristic of ABCD, they're like, okay, well, well but <laughs> maybe. <laughs> like, no, because we have a discussion about the about pseudoscience mm -hmm. versus science. And it's just like a simple list of things like horoscopes or astrology, um, the feet thing, I don't know, numerology and stuff. And they have to label it science or pseudoscience. Yeah. And they will do like the big bang. They'll say science, but I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like an asterisk, yeah. Yeah. you know, or creationism, science. Right. And so there, I can see that. I, I, I can see that blurry line right there. But I would think there are some topics that would just, like if you said, characteristics of a rock. I mean, mm -hmm. it's just very clear. There's, there's no heartfelt energy into that. But then when it moves into evolution, beginning of creation, that little blurry line of religion and what my heart says, mm -hmm. I could see that. I could see those. I mean, as a science teacher, I wouldn't do it, but I could see kids really wanting to push that limit just so they could say, because I believe it. Right. I don't care what you got to say about it. That's right. I'd like to just yeah. make a couple of comments on what Daryl was just talking about. I think the closest we came to what we are now was back in the days when you had people like Angela Davis being fired from the universities because she was a leftist or a communist. Right. And uh, of people that... Uh, well, at ETSU, people that were fired who were tenured faculty members mm -hmm. because they opposed the Vietnam War. So you had that going on, but it was very policy focused. Mm -hmm. There was, a, and, and it was part of this, the, the Red Scare in the 50s and 60s that took hold. Uh, but now I think, as, as Daryl is correct, this is far broader than that. This is this, this approach to understanding the world is way beyond that. And uh, there was always a, uh, a distrust, particularly in conservative areas about what you're being taught in college, particularly about the uh, communist. Of course, we're bringing that back again. I mean, to be a communist or a socialist is real easy. I remember years ago, I don't think we were on, I'm not sure if you were on campus, we had a, we had a discussion uh, about the, uh, the war in Central America. And I had several people come in to speak. And one of them was a spokesperson for the uh, guerrilla organization that was opposing this viciously right-wing government. And um, we talked afterwards for a while. And he said, you know, I, I never understood, he was from El Salvador, I never understood why the United States was particularly interested in this little country. 
But then I realized once I came here and, and compare that to the rest of the world, I realized that the politics in the United States begins in the center and goes to the right. So that I understood why people were calling, for example, Teddy Kennedy a leftist, because on the world stage, there's no way he was on the left. He was right in the middle. So I think that's a part of our heritage that's that's come to spades now. Yeah. Because anyone that disagrees with, well, with the Republicans now is is probably a communist or a radical socialist or something. Right. And and they throw around these terms of, of socialism, communism, right. you know, et cetera. And I always joke with the students, nobody in this country has seen a communist in 50 years. And, and, and I say that because, A, they have no reading or understanding of Marx, uh, of Lenin, mm -hmm. of, of uh, Mao, or any of the others who were so-called practitioners of it, right? Uh, they don't know what it means. Um, they have not traveled abroad to countries that uh, had that system of government and, and society. Um, they're not familiar with the arguments that undergird that. They don't even know the basics, such as, you know, when DOS Capital and, and uh, the Communist Manifesto were being written by, by Marx and Engels, they're not just writing it so they could be kooky lefties. They were writing it in part as a response to industrialization. Um, and while we can agree that there's some things we probably wouldn't agree with uh, Marx on, uh, you can see how he got there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, why he is attacking industrial society in the way that he is during uh, the 19th century. And so, um, you know, on a side note, it's not just the faculty, like at ETSU, right. that were attacked. Students were attacked. And if they misbehave, students now can do almost anything they want at ETSU right. within reason. Um, especially politically, nobody's going to stop them. Um, the administration will aggressively protect their rights to free speech and things of that nature. But at ETSU, along with other places, if you protested the Vietnam War, got involved in those types of things, suddenly you found yourselves with a GPA that was unsatisfactory, at which time, if you were a male student, they would quickly notify your draft board. Well, so right. that you would have to go to Vietnam. Wow. They would they would find ways. And there's a there was a professor uh, who's per, deceased. Uh, you you're gonna know you know who I'm talking about. It's from your department. Who bragged about that to me one day? The kid pissed him off. He didn't like him, and so he made sure the kid needed his class to get over the hump academically. He made sure the kid failed. Kid had to go to Vietnam. No, that, you know, I, and I point that out because this perception of the academy as this liberal bastion is a fairly recent one. Uh, in fact, Students for Democratic Society and other groups on, on the left of the political spectrum in the 60s, they were criticizing university faculty for being too close to industry, too close to, to mainstream politics as a part of the problem as opposed to part of the solution, which is why Angela Davis is in part right. in, attacked by Ronald Reagan and others uh, when she's at Davis, uh, excuse me, at Berkeley. Um, so I, I, not to go on the dying time there, but there's some interesting parts of that. And I'm concerned now, and I, and I bring it to this point, because now there are outside groups like Turning Point, for example, who are making their, who are self-appointing to go be the guardians of what they consider to be right and moral and just on university campuses. And so they're doing that in a couple of ways, organizing students, working with the college Republicans, but also creating uh, basically what amounts to, you know, a hit list of faculty members that, that they think are, you know, indoctrinating children. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, it smells like school board. <laughs> Check myself. <laughs> wow, wow, very interesting. It sounds like the uh it sounds like the Guns N' Roses song. Welcome to the jungle. Yeah. Oh. On a side note, I love Guns N' Roses. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that's that's some deep stuff there. I, I would never and, and not that I would never know that, but I I just never would have thought that. Mm -hmm. I would never have thought that uh, like in my lifetime.
Oh, very interesting. Yeah, well, they, and just to bring it back to higher education, to reiterate, I've seen some of the same articles and things saying how almost half of Americans don't know if higher education is worth it anymore across any political line. Um, and so just trying, and part of it is that folks think it's, you go there to get liberal brainwashed, mm -hmm. but I think this whole thing of being pushed to think critically and ask questions is not encouraged in certain exactly. areas. So, um, And that used to be the drive. You right. wanted, as a, even as any teachers, all of us, you, you want to create that child, that student who is inquisitive and wants to ask questions and wants that curiosity and wants to know more, not to pull, you know, pull you down, not to discredit your worth in front of them as a teacher, but to truly want to gain more knowledge and to move forward. And, and we're seeing that there, that lack of appreciation for that desire right there. It's mm -hmm. just not. I think part of the, part of the issue is that uh, there's always been a tension in, in American academics between uh, training and what I would call education in the broader sense. Or, and when it comes to call the liberal arts, you know, the ways to think and to crit critically analyze things. And um, I, I think that a part of the issue of where we're at today, is, and I, I haven't examined this carefully, but I think that part of the issue is we're moving more and more towards uh, towards training people. You can get a master's at ETSU to teach you how to manage uh, the Bristol Motor Speedway. Okay. And uh, I, I think that 50 years ago, that would be unheard of. You know, why, why would you, we get a master's degree in, in, in managing this? Um, so I think that's, that's part of the issue. That's fading, liberal arts is sort of fading away. A faculty that are retired uh, in the liberal arts are not being replaced, not just at ETSU, but right. arguably across the country. That's right. So that's uh, that's becoming a, a real issue. Yeah, I, I agree with you there, Ken. And I'd also go so far as to say, you know, that that just to bring it back for a moment, we've seen a charter school movement uh, in the country. Um, but race and ethnicity and gender is undergirding a lot of this opposition. And if you look at polling around public schools in yeah. the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, they were pretty darn high. No, it was, you didn't touch the schools. Now, you may not have got what you wanted, but you didn't attack schools, you didn't attack teachers. But as the schools became more diverse because of the fall of Jim Crow, there's where you see the calls for reform, right? And so, Reagan's attorney general, Bell, in the early part of uh, his first term, investigates this so-called crisis in education, mm -hmm. in which, oh, well, we have to have all this reform. We have to do this. We have to do that. We, oh, maybe we just need to do schools, right? And were there schools that were underperforming? Absolutely. And a lot of those were in minority communities. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. But the thing that they didn't address was, why were those communities so poor to begin with? That they didn't have resources. What happened to all the white residents who filled the, the, the tax base that funded those schools? Um, and we're seeing the same thing, not just at the K through 12, but universities. Mm -hmm. Those universities, whether it's ETSU or Harvard, have been the driver of the growth of the black middle class, right. of Latinx, of LGBTQ, et right. cetera. And it is, for, for lack of a better way to say it, has just pissed off a certain subset of white America who really resents that kind of racial progress and it feeds that kind of racial resentment that made Trump so potent and appealing to, to you know, literally 70 million or so Americans that voted for him in 2020. Absolutely. You know, today is the anniversary of the Charlottesville yes. uh, march. And so very pertinent with what you just said. I mean, I can hear them now. You shall not replace us, or something to that nature. And the, group, the great replacement theory, yes, yeah. they call it. right, right, and that's uh, it's real. Yeah. And there's just a lot unknowing uh, of true history, right, of what actually happened in underfunded schools, just being a product of 
funding of public schools coming from house taxes, your taxes on your house, but then black people not getting loans, and right? And that whole right. thing, yeah. So yeah. just all this layers and layers. I just, uh, you know, I can I can follow Adam Dixon around wherever he goes and just listen <laughs> to every word that comes out of his mouth. But he he spoke somewhere and mentioned um, some census, and again, I, I don't have the details, but is it maybe an area 601? Does that sound familiar? Some census data, but but apparently there is an area that's over there near Langston, and it's it must be in area 601 according to census. I don't know if it's law and property or what. But that for decades, that area has always been a poor neighborhood. Mm. No matter what's gone on around it, no matter what development has happened adjacent to it, that 601 census area has forever been a very, very poor neighborhood, uh, poor, uh, uh, not a lot of jobs. I mean, it's just that area. And you're like, how can we have all this growth in Johnson City and still have one, mm. one section? that does not see that, does not experience any of that. And, you know, I know why. I mean, yes. it's just it's, it's how it is. If you apply for a loan, no, you can't. Why not? Because I said so. Not because you can't afford it. Yeah. But there's so many, there are a lot of these rules and things that are in place that just do not help. A group of scholars last fall looked at that very issue as it related to the CARES grant money coming from the pandemic. And what they found even they isolated at all variable factors, they could not dismiss the racism component when it came to the awarding of those loans. And so uh, combined with the fact that when black small businesses, and most black small businesses have less than 10 employees, uh, when they went to their local bank, they were most often turned down. Mm -hmm. But when they went to the fintechs, these, these banks that are basically online and it's anonymous and all they can see is your, is your statement of financial mm -hmm. condition, they suddenly got their loans. I mean, like, just like that, they got their loans. And they were able to conclude that not only was the scuttlebutt that people were speculating on, on chat lines and things like that was correct, but they, they went far, far deeper because of what you just mentioned. You couldn't even question. They wouldn't even tell you why you weren't getting loans. These were federally guaranteed loans. They were basically masquerading as loans that were actually grants. All you had to do is keep your doors open. Mm -hmm. And they would forgive the loans. And Magic Johnson, the famed uh, basketball star who became extremely wealthy as a businessman and, uh, and as a big businessman, realized early on in the fall of 2020 that banks were deliberately not passing that money. And not only that, but the Trump administration was keeping that money out of black camps too. And uh, brown hands as well. And uh, he got together with other big businessmen and started working with the treasury department to have that money fueled through businesses he was associated with, which got into the hands of small black businesses across the country. And so um, I point that out, not because Trump did yet something else wrong. But this has effectively been U.S. government policy for 100 years. Mm -hmm. You know, Trump just was blatant about it. But, I mean, the entire New Deal is segregated so that it benefits white Americans in a way that it does not benefit Black Americans. And so when we're looking at that. No wonder that most white households have a household income or household wealth, I should say, of $180,000, while Black families are $18,000 or less. Mm -hmm. And that includes Johnson City, where the, the, the uh, numbers are even more stark. Yeah, I think that reveals a larger syndrome in the United States. You know, we, we or the, the official story is we have great, this great democracy, et cetera. Well, I, don't, I, I beg to differ, you know, we, 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 we follow democratic practices by making deals, by making deals first with, with the Democratic Party in the South for years and years that you, can, you, you do what you want with black folks, you know, but we're, we're going to keep going with all these other things that we're doing. 
And I think the only difference is, as Daryl pointed out, now now it's, it's just blatant. It's it's okay. It's not. It can be out. You know, it used to be sort of we have a democracy, but you know, don't look what don't, don't look what we're doing over here. Yes. You know, if you're black, it's you know, just be glad you're in a democracy, right? Yeah. But now it's it's becoming more open. Um, actually, in a pretty terrifying, terrifying manner. I was when I was at he tissued. I can't remember what I was doing or working, but um, the um, president, the national president of NAACP, I think, came and spoke, and he said that you know back in the forties, fifties with KKK, he said you knew who the racist people were because they had the little clown hats and dressed in their their gowns and blah blah blah. He said, but today they wear three piece suits. Mm -hmm. They they stand in line with you at the grocery store. Yep. Uh, you may even work next to them in your little office cubicle, but they, they just blend in. And now, today, this was in the probably 80s, 90s, he said that, but today, 2022, you, they will let you know, I am racist. Look at me right now. I am racist. Yeah. I will let you know. And and it's not hidden at all. It's not. They're and proud of it. I'm proud. Yes, I'm proud to let you know that. And that is scary. Yeah. Um, that's, I don't know, that is scary. Yeah. Uh, it, it is frightening. Uh, Trump, in part, we, we give him too much credit because he's not that bright. But yes, he had a substantial impact upon making it publicly acceptable to yes. be bigoted. Um, but this, you know, predated him. I mean, the, the Republican Party has been flirting with crazies, racists, and others for 60 years. Mm -hmm. It's not a surprise that one of them took over the party. Uh, the Republican Party made a cynical calculation that they could accept the John Birchers, the Ku Klux Klaners, the neo-Nazis, the, the gun nuts, the separatists, uh, the anti-government zealots, um, as a part of their electoral coalition without having to pay the piper down the line when those people eventually said, hey, where's our power? We voted for you. Where's our power? I mean, there's only one occasion in the past 30 years that I've seen Republicans pump the brakes. And that was a, a unique circumstance in 1995 in Oklahoma City when Timothy McVeigh blew up the federal building. And uh, for a few weeks, the Republicans kind of like, oh, we've got to back off a little bit. This, this, this is not good for us. But then since Obama, they have doubled, tripled, quadrupled down on well, that's okay. It's going to win us elections, you know, and that's why I take a position, for example, on Lynn Cheney, who's getting a lot of credit from Democrats for her work on the January 6th committee. And my position is, no, you don't deserve any credit because you and your father, the former vice president of the United States, were quite content to play off these people to get elected um, and, and to reach high office. I mean, despite all the good things that Bush had tried to do to open up the Republican Party in the late 90s and early 2000s, particularly with Latinos, but also with, with Black people. Uh, they were perfectly willing as well to accept that as a means to an end uh, politically. And so eventually you keep doing that. And the crazies, as I like to call them, will take over the party. Um, and so I don't want to hear anything from the Lynn Cheney's or the Mitch McConnell's or the other people because you enable these people to do what they're doing. I mean, just yesterday, the House speak, uh, excuse me, the, the wannabe House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy, basically encouraged the elected Republicans to target the FBI. Yeah. yeah. That's remarkable. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I've never seen an elected official at that level of government encourage other elected officials to politically target arguably the most revered law enforcement agency in the Western world, the FBI. Despite all the, their reputation being in tatters, they're still highly regarded. Yeah. You know. yeah. Or have you ever seen uh, until recently someone campaigning for public office uh, in a video breaking into a house saying that we're going to we, we would get these rhinos, make sure you get these rhinos and they all were carrying weapons. Yeah. That's very, that's scary. That's really new. People are going to die. I never thought we would elect someone. We've gone and we've all said Republicans and 
in, in our in our local district re representing us at the state and and uh, national level. I never thought we'd have Diana Harshwarder, whose campaign involves her with a weapon. Wow! Mm -hmm. wow. I, I never thought we would see that. Yeah. Wow. And yet that's become you know that's you know, I don't want to get off the Second Amendment, but they they ignore the whole part of the whole second part of the Second Amendment, mm -hmm. which. If I were the Supreme Court, I wouldn't interpret it that way. Yeah, they're talking about a militia. Talk about that's the National Guard. It's become the National Guard, and it makes sense to me. You arm this militia and all this stuff, but now it's become we forget that part. Yeah. Now everybody has to have a weapon. Yeah. And uh, of course, you've seen the recent one about uh, one of the sheriffs in a county in South Carolina said, "What we're going to do is we're going to put AR-15s." In schools and lockers with a lock on them, so that the, the cops can, when the, the people are taking care of you, can come in there, open up the things, Locked and get the. You know, it's things. like, are, are you going? Are you crazy? Yeah. If if someone gets in there before you, it takes about five seconds to kill a whole bunch of people, and then you can open the lockers up. Yeah. You're going to go in there and get. You're going to find that locker, that specific it's, locker. Yeah. I mean, uh, I I never thought I would see I this. Hope Combination. Well, didn't Ted Cruz say something stupid like, let's take all the doors off and, you yeah. know, just have that one they door in the front? Yeah. I'm, yeah, I, I, I never think that. They'll never have a fire group because there won't be any fires. Yeah, I was like, right. I don't think that's going to pass with the state fire marshal. Yeah. You know, you put a kid's life. Well, if you get a good Republican fire marshal, it'll be okay. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> We need to have a Republican on here to defend themselves. Well, you know, the, 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 I, will, I will say this. We put a lot of blame, rightfully so, on the Republican Party and their activists and affiliations and, and uh, things of that nature. But we don't, and I think it's a fair criticism, we don't fair, uh, criticize the Democratic Party enough. And one is the Democratic Party has been criticized from the left for being too neoliberal, all this kind of stuff. But really the criticism I have for the party is that the they failed to recognize that since at least 1968, they were in a war. They failed to recognize it. Even right now, they're still trying to play as though uh, it's a legitimate game. And whether it's Richard Nixon or it's Justice Lewis Powell or uh, uh, Justice Rehnquist or Clarence Thomas or it's Mitch McConnell, or it's Kevin McCarthy, it does not matter. And of course, all the groups that undergird that, they are, they are literally working to destroy from within. And the Democrats are kind of like, I don't see anything. We'll see no evil yeah. And so it's like, okay, you're in a foot race, except for your, your, your competition started six decades ago. And I've heard the analogy a marathon versus a sprint and the Republican Party having taken this marathon approach where, you know, and you can talk a little bit about this with what's happening with local government yeah. and how the average person thinks, okay, I got to go every four years to vote for president and that's good enough, yeah. right? But all these local elections is what's going to affect your day-to-day. -day. Your day-to-day, they don't watch that, right? Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of ways, the local governments and the, and the state governments have a little bit more direct day-to-day -day impact on the lives. Now, if you're retired on Social Security and Medicare, then it's a little bit different. But if you're still of working age, it may be the, the local government that has a bigger impact. And I was on TV last week uh, after the elections on August 4th and was asked about Washington County mayor's race being so close. And I said, I'm sure it was because nobody voted. Right. Nobody voted. Yeah. And then you complain about who you got in office. And it's like, well, you didn't vote either. You know, and, but on the there was an article in the New York Times magazine just a week or two ago that was excellent, uh, talking about the stop the steal. Okay. And the author was making the point that there has been a realization among these people that where they really need to go is the local level. County election commissions, county mayor, uh, county clerks, 
and property assessors and city commissions and small counties. Because if they can gum up the 20,000 gears at that level, you can paralyze the federal government. And in many ways, they, they have work to do that. It's not just the post-2020 thing. They've been working to do that for quite some time. Absolutely. And I think what's helping feed that is, you know, we, we keep talking about Republicans and Democratic Party, but on, on a worldwide basis, uh, faith in parties has yeah. declined precipitously, mm -hmm. um, which, which has aided and abetted a Trump-like character, yeah. you know, who is making a difference. You can, you can be the Rumpelstiltskin party, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. But he's taking advantage of that. And um, parties are basically seen as as useless uh, enterprises. Right. How about what about Congress? Mm. Congress is seen as useless. It's been like that for years, but it's getting more and more like this. Right. More re recent polls show that the uh, uh, the trust in government period yeah. is low, and as a consequence, you'll have the Trumpers either at the national level or at the local level, mm. at the dog catcher level. You'll have Trumpers basically reiterating that, yeah. that, uh, you know, a rhino is a Republican in name only, but the real Republicans are ones who don't give a damn about the Republican Party mm -hmm. because it, it's a waste of time. Yeah. What do you see? A small action, a big action. What's the next thing someone should do if they want to change or get involved or try to? turn the tide within one person in, in this area? Well, I Not think there, there's strong evidence uh, that on the Republican side of the aisle, bear with me, the, uh, that they are now avoiding the lamestream, as some like to call it, or the mainstream or the legacy media meeting, CNN, the New York Times, et cetera. And they're touching two areas. One, the conservative media outlets who are friendly to them. The reason why is the local media still has a big impact on people locally. Uh, they live in the community. People know them. They see them at the stores. And I point that out because uh, you still have a situation, including here, where there's a staggering level of distrust in government, yet uh, a belief among a lot of local people about their local institutions that are supposedly standing in the breach, right? Pre preventing bad stuff mm -hmm. from happening. And I'm saying that because uh, any type of national renewal has to start locally, community by community by community by community in which uh, people, uh, particularly who have local influence are going to disabuse their, their neighbors of kooky conspiracy theories of anti-government zealotry of you know this this really kind of toxic mindset um and if that doesn't happen i'm not sure it can happen anywhere i think i have to start local what do you think yeah uh, that's could be it's a tough it's a tough road to hoe, okay. that's for sure yeah. uh, i i'm not overly optimistic i wish i could find a little more uh, optimism about that. Um, but there are so many factors that are mitigating uh, against the, uh, yeah. if Trump were to say the moon is made out of green cheese, I'm afraid that, it, it, I don't know how to get around that. Um, it, it, we have, we, know, we have friends who have relative young people who got COVID. Mm -hmm. This is in Washington County and just, just north of us in Sullivan County. And they went to, to uh, their, some physician and he prescribed them ivermectin. Okay. And I, I don't know how to get around that when I mean, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a biologist. But I, I basically understand that if you, you, I know what parasites are and, and, and horses get them and you can help clear them out. 
But the last time I checked, and I don't think there's any disagreement here, COVID is not a parasite. So it, when you have people of trust, educated people, and a lot of friends that we've had over years, I used to have good discussions with uh, Republican yeah. friends, which, you know, you have a lot of friends around here are going to be Republicans. Yeah. Yeah. And we used to have discussions about policy. But we can't. They're disinterested now in speaking about politics yes. at any level. Uh, we had a guy join our, our book club. And it's, it's ironic because the first book we did, men's book club, we, it was the first book we read was How Democracies Die. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I hope we don't do any po politics right. in there. And I was thinking to myself, politics is, is you're going to find politics in every book you're going to read. Yeah. Whether it be fiction or nonfiction or something like this. So that's a long way to say that I'm, I, I understand what Daryl's saying, but it, it's, I'm not sure how to crack that nut right now, how to get around yeah. Uh, th that pervasiveness of, of, of people, particularly people who are friends of mine, mm -hmm. with whom I can't talk about. They, they, they won't want to talk about politics. Right. They won't want to talk. They, 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 they sort of su to support whatever's going on with the Republicans. And they, they, they lean back on, well, I've always been a Republican. But that's like... Uh, you know, college kids do yeah. before yeah. they begin to think about it. That's scary. That is scary. I, I think you bring up an excellent point there. And, you know, the, the idea that you just mentioned that, you know, uh, I, I can't talk about politics. I don't like politics. You know, uh, all the time with my students, I, I point out politics is everywhere. Yeah. It's everywhere. I, and I always tease them a little bit. And I'll say to the young uh, uh, men in the room, uh who are uh who are cisgender and uh straight and all that and i'll say uh when you're uh you know dating your girlfriend uh do you call her fat <laughs> to her face do, do you do you do you t tell her do you, do you tell her how awful she is and, and of course they all kind of giggle and they say of course not and i'll say now why not because she'll get mad and well she'll take it out on me in some way i said there's politics you've made a calculation maybe you want her uh to to agree to your decision on where to go on vacation maybe you want her to do something else you that's you trying to influence her that's politics right mm -hmm. do you go to your boss in the middle of the day and just, and just jack slap them what no you don't do that at all right um you make calculated decisions right um in part based on self-interest whether your interest is to have a har harmonious relationship with your spouse or it's to get a raise at work so you kiss up to the boss you or you find out your boss is a liberal so you you downplay that you're a conservative just so that you can make sure you're in good place there we, we, we don't think of that as politics, but it is political. You're acting in a political sense. You're trying to get something. Um, and the fact that they are so easily led astray because they, they lack the critical thinking skills is important to note. I think it's also important to note, and just to flat out say it, there's a large number of Americans, still the minority, but yes, a large number of Americans who want to see it burn. You know, they want to see the country burn. Um, in their minds, the country is, cannot be saved. It has to be destroyed and rebuilt. And if you listen to some of the language online in the social media sites um, from some of these individuals, uh, that's exactly what they're saying. And these, it's, it's, it's too broken in their opinion. It has to be torn down, uh, which is how you get to well, if we just take everything down, the administrative state, the whole, the whole nine yards, and go back to the founding fathers, then we can start fresh. You know, and it's that's a very scary place to be. And, you know, I keep saying they, they're telegraphing their fear. Yeah. You know, these are not confident people. When you have a bunch of young white men show up in Charlottesville five years ago today, 
chanting, you will not replace us. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you all, but I'm thinking of, you know, five-year-old kids who are throwing a tantrum because they're scared about whatever's happening. I'm not going to bed. Yeah. You're going to do this to me, you know. And these were not stereotypical people who came from the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. These were people who were university faculty and staff, like that one kid who's, who's face became famous he worked at the university in nevada you know <laughs> I, i'm just pointing these things out to say we're in a really dark place we've got to figure a, a way out and what's undergirding all this i i'm convinced as a scholar and as a, uh, an american citizen is this you know sea change over the last hundred years that uh has totally upended what the country was when it was founded in the 1700s yeah absolutely so. and uh that's being resisted in space yes. sure i i think and this is that little piece of optimism that i have is that and maybe it's my circle too but i i i i feel that there are there is a majority of people who want to see America be a better place, who are willing to have a productive conversation with anyone, regardless of what side of the political line they're on. And I feel that that majority is just sitting at home on the couch going, what the hell's happening? Mm -hmm. Excuse my language. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that <clears throat> these people need to get off the couch and start having a conversation. Um, you know, I, I'm guilty. I, I now I'm hooked on reels on Facebook, which is their version of TikToks. <laughs> but they have these crazy situations where, you know, there's some racial something going on. And there are so many people that just walk by. Like, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to even say, I'm not even going to stop and look. Yeah. Just walking on by. And I think if, if that's how people are in line, right. these things are never going to be addressed. Well, and I don't think it needs to be big actions, too. No. I think if people knew it can be the small things. I think about the TikTok thing of a cab driver or Uber driver or something, white guy picking up two um, white passengers. And the woman said, oh, thank God you're a white guy. Right. And he was like, excuse me. And she's like, well, you like speak English. And you're like a normal white guy. And he was like, get out. Yeah. Right. And he can't build the fair. I remember that. Yeah. I and saw. so it's like, it's not, I was like, yay, that's, we just need that to build well, up more and more of those type of actions yeah. from, you know, not, not the underrepresented people, because I think that falls on deaf ears right. a lot of times. And, and I think that every person who wants this country to move forward in a positive way, positive for everybody. Okay. It, it could be just a conversation. I mean, uh, and I, you know me, I'll talk to a rock. But I was at, <laughs> I was at a store one time in line, and and you know, if y'all, if this, the people that, uh, the woman I was sit talking to behind me, and the the Hispanic guy in front of me, a Latinx guy in front of me, we're standing there, and so the guy, so there is a white cashier, and there is is I'm a Latinx man, and the cashier is counting money like $1, $2, counting, counting, counting. And he looks at the guy and he says, $1.50. And the guy says, he, he gestures, like, what are you talking about? So the guy counts it again. And so me being a nice person, I'm like, I don't know, maybe this guy didn't have enough money. I don't know what's going on. I said, hey, can I help you out? Like, I'm ready to give you a dollar, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just helping. And this little white woman, Karen, behind me says, See, that's why those folks need to stay where they're, where they're, uh, they need to stay where they came from. You get over here and you can't speak the language. You going on and on and on. And I want to just take my little fist and go, bop, but I didn't. Because my mama <laughs> said, be nice. So I didn't. But I'm like, well, you never know. I don't know what's going on. And we're whispering, right? So she didn't have the ovaries to say it out loud. So anyway, I know. I said that. <laughs> so, so the cashier, <laughs> and and it's right and mm -hmm. then he says the white cis uh, heterosexual mm -hmm. white man need not apply we know where that came from says oh i just hate counting money and this is the hispanic guy walks away latin, latin mm -hmm. 
walks away. He goes, I just hate counting money. And I say to the guy out loud, so you were the holder. You were the one that was having a problem. He goes, oh, yeah. He says, I hate counting change. I said, and I looked at the lady behind me, Karen. I looked at you and I said, it wasn't that guy. It was the white dude. Mm-hmm. Like, so, I mean, just that moment, it probably was a 10, 15 minute conversation because we were waiting for a long time because Scott had count that change. But I just think people need to say that you don't have to smack anybody, you don't have to beat them down like you do Walmart. You just, you just need to say something. And, and I think, I think, and it goes back to what can we do in this community? Go vote, get off the couch yeah. and go vote. Like, I'm so sad that this few number of people voted right. in Washington County. Yes. And our next um, conversations that matter will be an hour of why someone who hates counting money is working as a cashier. Right? <laughs> 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 what are you thinking, man? Uh, I, I was think? just thinking about the the face of the face of, of, of racism and, and ethnic uh, discrimination. It takes takes different forms all over the world. I'm most familiar with Latin American mm-hmm. stuff, and uh, you never know how that's going to work out. For example, there was a there was an article in the paper quite a few years ago. A guy was interviewing a, a guy in uh, Dominican Republic, and by all appearances, I, I would call him a black man. He was interviewing. And he was telling the reporter that the problem with Dominican Republic is that people from Haiti, and he said, all these black people are moving into our country. And the reporter said, well, you don't consider yourself black? No, yo soy Dominicano, I'm a Dominican. So the whole identity thing was swapped around in terms of the, what was going on in that country. Or one, one more anecdote, uh, a guy that I got to know in, in Guaranda, Ecuador, when I was doing research there, a uh, young guy, and uh, we just asked him, he said, you know, he was, you know, white in Mestizo. Um, and uh, we said, would your parents be more upset if you brought home a girlfriend who was black or indigenous, without hesitate, oh no, if she were Indian, that would be much worse. So all of these levels of, of oh, yeah. racial stuff just come out in all kinds of strange uh, ways. In uh, Felipe, that we had, mm-hmm. he talked about that, and mm-hmm. you know that's he's from Brazil, right? Yeah. Yes, and he was talking about the same thing happening in his culture, and I'm like. It's everywhere. Yeah, it but, is. It but is. I will say this, you know, as an Americanist, you know, the American system of race is unique, even though it bears some similarities to what's happening in Central and South America. Um, and there's a couple reasons why. One, the race line is much firmer and harder here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, slavery was much harsher here. Yeah. Um, and while you had elements of Spain, Portugal, et cetera, in Central and South America, which were undergirded in part by the Catholic Church, uh, the Catholic Church was more moderate on the slave issue in the sense of, you know, you had to do certain things, teach teach slaves to read, primarily for the Bible, right? Uh, but the British didn't do that. Uh, the British didn't have any compulsion whatsoever. I mean, you didn't have to acknowledge your children. And so you had a form of slavery in the United States that was a race-based, it was much harsher, and it was unlike anything that had been seen in other parts of the world. Because you can go to the Middle East, you can go to Africa, uh, uh, you can go to Europe, and you could see people who become slaves become prominent members of society later on. Mm. That couldn't happen here. And so by the late 20th century, early 21st century, when you see prominent Black people get into high office, become extremely wealthy. It really undergird this, hey, something's wrong with the country. We got to do something. Burn it down. You know, I mean, and as I've, you know, I don't take credit for this particular quote, but it's absolutely true when, you know, it's 
those kinds of inequities are so baked into the American system that when you protest them, people think you're protesting the country. Yeah. 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 You know, so tough, tough situation. Tough change. I, I still have a little bit of optimism, uh, but we can't sit on our butt. I, you know, I've said it before. I don't believe in hope. Hope is passive. <clears throat> hope is sitting on the couch going, gosh, I hope. I hope it doesn't rain on my my <laughs> hammock outside <laughs> while you're sitting on your butt. You need to go get your dang hammock. Yeah. So I feel like we have to we have to be active. We have to do things to make this change. We can't sit on our tails anymore. Yes. So and speaking of sitting on our tails, it is a little bit after eight. We gotta wrap <laughs> this up. Sarah's so, got to make it to dinner. Oh, yes. yes. I know. But there are a couple of events coming up. Can you see their open house? Am I correct? Open house this Saturday. This Saturday, 10 to 12. 10 to 2. 10 to 2. And it's somebody's birthday. Michelle Treats. Happy birthday. Uh, Happy birthday. Happy Thank birthday. Uh, next Saturday, August the 20th, is a mural unveiling, Sounds of Our Soul. And it's also the rescheduling of Emancipation um, Day at the Harvard. The Center will be there. Yay for McKinney Center. Yes, at Carver, and I think there was one other thing coming up on Saturday the 27th at ETSU Culp Center. There is a presentation about um, ACE, that's the um, Adverse, adverse Childhood, childhood experiences. experiences as it relates to the Black population. Mm-hmm. So, so I, will, uh, I will be there. Lots of stuff. Yes, great, great opportunity. There's a new uh, committee. Our social is a new Black student Social, I think it's the Black Social Workers of Northeast Tennessee. There you go, Mm. that'll work. That's a pretty new organization, I think so. Yeah, Yeah. well, can I make a couple announcements real quick? Yes, yes. Uh, these will be Black American Studies events for ETSU, (laughs) and there's two of them that I want to mention. Uh, one is on September the 20th in Brown Hall on the campus, and it's open to the public, and that is the famed Black poet. Uh, Nikki Giovanni mm. will be here um, <gasps> on September the 20th. And we will have information in the next few days on our website, um, or you can email me directly. Um, uh, on October 13th, which is a Thursday night, so it won't interfere with church, um, we uh, will be hosting, Black American Studies will be hosting uh, uh, Meharry Medical College's president, Dr. James Hildreth. Meharry Medical College is uh, a historic Black medical school mm-hmm. in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And so uh, their president, Dr. Hildreth, has been one of President Biden's uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, advisors. He has largely directed Middle Tennessee, particularly Nashville's COVID response. Uh, he is a famed uh, Rhodes Scholar, John Hopkins graduate, Harvard graduate, um, and, and prolific researcher. And so we have two major events coming there, and we will also have uh, a series of events in November for Black, uh, excuse me, for Black, the Black American Studies Program, but for Hip Hop History Month. And so. Uh, Please, please reach out to me for, with emails. We'd love to have you there. All of our events are free and open to the public. Yay. That sounds great. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. Um, yes. Lots to think about. Lots to think about. Yes. Thank you. We'll have to have you back in and talk about your uh, your international experiences. Yeah. I think that's mm-hmm. great. Well, thank you for having yeah. us. Thank you. Enjoy, folks. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bye.